is because deep down they're hurting. And they, they need family that maybe they're not getting at home. For others of you, you may be the only Christian in your family. And so, lo and behold, the church family is kind of your surrogate, right? So as you think about that, you know, I tell people that Sunday morning is the occasion for what I call the biggest lie in the church. And you guys know what it is. Every Sunday morning, we hear the, the phrase, how are you doing? The response, I'm fine. Okay, the reality is there are people in this room who maybe even tonight, you're not doing fine. In fact, there may be people in this room who you have relationships, whether it be your marriage, maybe it's relationships with people here that are, right now, they're pretty fragile. In fact, there may be some of you who you drove all the way to this building in silence with your spouse because, lo and behold, you're going through one of those valleys of life. Again, let me remind you, our children are watching us. True? And they're modeling their lives after us. And so we've got to get this right so that ultimately they will get it right. I'm going to be talking about how we fix broken relationships during this second hour. And hopefully what I share with you you can apply to either your marriage relationship or, now I, again, I know this doesn't happen in this, this church family, but you know, down south, we got some people, sometimes they don't like each other in the church. They don't want to sit on the same pew. They, they don't like to come in the same door. And when they see each other, it's kind of that ice cold stare. Tonight, we're going to fix that. Now, let me start out by saying there are two different methods that people a lot of times, when they're trying to fix a, a relationship, they will use. And to me, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. In other words, both of these solutions have a problem, okay? On one side, in, in one ditch, you have what in modern counseling terms is called the neotherapeutic model. It's all about feelings. How do you feel? And so here's what the counselor does. Counselor will bring either a couple or, or maybe two people who are mad at each other, bring them into the office, and they'll turn to one of them, maybe the wife, and they'll say, okay, tell me what's going on. And here's what the wife says. Well, my husband, he doesn't do this, and he does this, and wrong, and he doesn't do this, and he doesn't do this. And the counselor lets her go on and on and on. And after a few minutes, he finally turns to the wife and says, how does that make you feel? Yeah. And then after she gets done, he turns to the husband. He says, okay, now you've heard her. How does that make you feel? Now, let me just go ahead and tell you right up front, this just, this just makes me want to gag. And the reason why is because here's what's happening. The wife unloads, and then the husband unloads, all the while this counselor is basically saying, how does it make you feel like your heart really should be the judge? Folks, the Bible tells you, the heart? Take a look, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 10, 23, oh Lord, I know the way man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. According to the Bible, we shouldn't be going on these feelings. Amen? Because at the end of the day, here is what that counselor is really saying. He's turning to the wife and saying, what does your egocentric, narcissistic, sinful life really want. And she dumps it all out and he turns to the husband and says, okay, can you live with that? And then he turns to the husband and says, all right, 
what does your egocentric, narcissistic life really want? And he lays it all out. There, and then he turns to the wife and says, okay, can you live with that? All right, great. Now, you guys go be sinful, egocentric, narcissistic couple together. Folks, that's not going to work. Multiple reasons, but the number one reason is this. Eventually, either the husband or the wife is going to realize, you know what? I, I, I forgot to mention X because I really want them to do X too. And they just kind of keep adding and building and adding and building. And, and so at the end of the day, what you get is a system that doesn't work. Now, on the other side of the ditch, opposed to this feelings-oriented is what we call the directive approach. Now, the directive approach, basically the counselor says this. Okay, y'all tell me what's going on. Husband and wife say, he says, okay, here's what I'm hearing. You're doing X, Y, Z. Here's what you should be doing. These are sinful behaviors, sinful appetites. This is why they're bad. Stop doing this. Go do that. Now, what's the problem with that one? Well, the problem with this one is <laughs> some of you, you can do it for a while. But eventually, you're going to slip up, right? In fact, there's some of you guys, you could do it for months. I'm, I'm going to treat this out. I'm going to do this. And then you know what happens? You have a bad day at work. I'm talking one of those days where from the time you get up, it feels like birds have been pooping on your head until you come home. And you come home and you forget what you were supposed to be doing, what your counselor said. And so lo and behold, your spouse says, aha, see, I told you. I knew you weren't really going to change. And so you know what you do? <laughs> you get mad. You, fine, that's it. Okay. I tried. You, you, you can't even appreciate that I tried. And so lo and behold, what happens? It gets worse. The second problem with this directive approach is that it is feeding what I call is our, our hunger for works righteousness. Okay? Inside every human being, whether we like to admit it or not, there's this little bitty bit of us that deep down we think we can do something as a part of our salvation. It, it, you know, we, we think works righteousness. You say, Brad, what do you mean by that? Yeah, we, we love Jesus. We love what he did on the cross. But at the end of the day, we want to read the Bible to see what it tells us to do so that we can add to that. And folks, think about that for just a minute. If Jesus needed you to add anything to him on the cross, you'd be up there beside him. He didn't need you to add anything on the cross. And so sadly... What this does is it kind of feeds our pride. Why do I say that? Our attitude is like this. I went to the Bible. I found out what I'm supposed to do, and I did it. So it's all about who? It's about me. In other words, thanks, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Now, look here at all the works that I've added to your sacrifice. I'm here, God. How does that make you feel? Well, again, like I said, there's a ditch on both sides, right? How do we fix this thing? Well, the first thing we got to do is we got to realize this whole works thing, not what God intended. You know, the husband says, I dedicated myself. It didn't work, so now I'm going to rededicate myself again like they play a major role in their salvation now Jesus plays the role in your salvation so let's let's use the Bible to see how we can bridge some of the problems in our relationships turn back to the book of Ephesians you know we spent some time there early on we read chapter 5 where it talks specifically about 
marriage, right? Chapter 5. Now, this time we're going to back up one chapter. Now, let me kind of set the, the stage for where we're at, what we're doing. If you look at Ephesians, it splits very cleanly into two different distinct areas. Chapters 1 through 3 are orthodoxy or about right believing. Chapter 4 starts out with, with Paul saying, therefore. Therefore what? Because of all this, this is how you should live your life. And so chapters 4, 5, and 6 are about orthopraxy or right living. Now, here's the problem. We read chapters 4, 5, and 6, and what we do is we read the imperatives. Anybody English major in this room? Couple. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me give you a real quick... Let me give you a real quick review for those of you non-grammarians. Remember, there's indicatives and imperatives. An indicative is indicating what something is, right? This is a chair. That's an indicative. Or you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. That is an indicative. An imperative would say this. Sit in that chair. It's telling you to do something. Or, be ye holy as I am holy. By the way, both of those are from 1 Peter, right? You know what we focus on when we read Ephesians 4, 5, and 6? We focus on the imperatives, the, the, what we're supposed to do. Let, let me share with you what I'm talking about, because I think we've got this backwards. We think, because of our actions, that we then are something. You say, what do you mean, Brad? Well, we think the imperatives are growing out of the indicatives. Let me show you what I mean. I will do the imperative so that I can achieve this. In other words, I'm going to do holiness so that I can be a holy nation. Is that true? Why are you a royal priesthood? Is it because of anything you did? It's because of who? It's because of Jesus that you can even do the other. Sometimes we get that backwards. So as we start working through this, please keep in mind the difference between an indicative, indicating what something is, versus an imperative. Because again, if you could achieve the righteousness of yourself, you wouldn't have need for Jesus, correct? All right, take a look. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, reminds us we're all like an unclean thing. All of our righteousness are filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf with all of our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all of sin fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. So can we do it ourselves? The answer is no. Yes. Isaiah 64, verse 6. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, setting up the fact that even though we think we can play a part in our own salvation, works righteousness, the best you've got to offer God is like filthy rags. So with that background, let's talk about how we can actually heal some of these relationships. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, right before where we're talking about marriage in chapter 5. Look at what Paul writes. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we're all members of one another. Do not, I say, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for the necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So here's how a lot of times we look at this. If we break it down verse by verse, 
Verse 25 says, Put away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we're members of one another. What is the imperative or, or what is the command? Is to speak the truth, right? Verse 26, be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Again, we look at that and we read that as, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be angry and sin not. By the way, is it okay to occasionally be angry? Was Jesus ever angry? Absolutely. The problem is, you notice what it says. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Some of us, we like to be angry. In fact, some of us, what we do is we hold on to our anger like a weapon. And we like to use it and we think to ourselves, I'm going to be angry at you until you do what I want you to do. And basically, we, we hold on to it until we feel like that person has suffered as much as we think they ought to suffer. Here's the problem with that. When you do that, number one, you're violating the scripture. Number two, notice what the next verse says. It says, nor give place to the devil. When you're holding on to your anger, who are you giving place to? Satan. In fact, he's whispering in your ear. He's saying, you may not be angry enough. You are right to be angry. Which, by the way, that's pride. Do you understand that? When you think somebody has hurt you, what you've done is you've elevated yourself and you've pulled them down. By the way, when you elevate yourself, you've just moved yourself into the position that should only be held by Christ or God. You know what he's not telling you? By holding on to your anger, here's what Satan's not telling you. He's not telling you, I own you. Because at this point, you've taken your eyes off Christ and you're thinking about yourself. All right, keep looking. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. It says, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Again, we read that, we say, what's the imperative? The imperative is, do not steal, but rather labor. Now, let me point out to you, this is a biblical example of real repentance. Because not only are you not to steal, but he says you're supposed to go do what? You're supposed to go work. You know, you hear the word repentance, that means that we change. What does that look like in Scripture? Take a look at Exodus chapter 22, verse 4. Exodus 22, verse 4 says, If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be an ox, an ass, a sheep, he, will, he shall restore double. Double. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually biblical repentance. You know why? Because if you take my ox, not only do you have to give me back my ox, you know what else you got to do? You have to give me one of yours because you deprived me of an ox. That's repentance. Why, why would I bring that up when it comes to marriage? I, I bring that up because sometimes we treat our spouse or a friend in such a way that simply saying I'm sorry, is that enough? Is saying you're sorry repentance? No. It's a start, amen. But if you treat your wife like a doll, is that all you need to worry about? No. There's got to be some repentance, some making up there. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart the grace to the hearers. It's interesting there, that passage, let no corrupt, it actually means let no decayed or, or dying word out of your mouth. So again, we look at that and we say, what's the imperative? Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. 
Now, we look at that and we go back to the very first imperative we read where it says speak the truth to one another. And so here's what some people say. They say, well, I, I can say this because I'm just telling it like it is. You ever heard that expression? <laughs> yeah, I'm just telling them the truth. Now, what you're actually doing is you're sinning with your mouth. Because what you're doing is you're crushing another human being with your words, with your tongue. And the Bible says, don't do that. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. How can you obey that imperative and then harmonize it with let no corrupt talk? You say, well, Brad, you don't understand. I'm just speaking my mind. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Because what you should be speaking as a Christian is the mind of Christ, not your mind. Colossians chapter 3 says when you come up out of that water, you're to put on the new man. You put yourself to death. So if you're speaking your mind, you know what that tells me? It tells me you're thinking a little too highly of yourself. And maybe, just maybe, you need to start speaking the mind of Christ. You say, wait, does that mean that, that we back off the truth? Because he or she really did say or do that. No, you don't do that. Because again, what was the very first imperative we read tonight? Ephesians chapter 4, speak the truth, right? But we're supposed to speak the truth in what? In love. Can two people say the same thing but in a different way that comes across totally different? Absolutely. As somebody who is in a relationship with a fellow brother or sister in Christ, does it matter how you speak the truth to them? Absolutely. Are there going to be times where in this room you have to confront somebody about something that you just don't even want to have to talk about? Yeah, because we're part of a family, right? And you know what? Sometimes families have issues. Sometimes we got like more baggage in the Samsonite store. But what we have to do is we have to speak the truth in love because ultimately everybody in this room should want everybody to go to heaven. Amen? That should be our driving force. Check out verse 30 and 31. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Again, this goes back to that first imperative. If I say that something is true, but I'm also being slanderous or, or bitter, then I'm in sin. It matters how I communicate with somebody. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. <laughs> Are we good at that? <laughs> the answer, no. I, I, I'll go ahead and tell you guys. We have a saying in America that I do not understand. Okay, my background is in anatomy and neurobiology. I study the brain, spinal cord, nerves, all that. We have a saying. Have you ever heard of forgive and forget? Okay, let me point out to you, a forgetful brain is a non-working brain, right? When somebody is forgetting something, that means you got dementia, Alzheimer's, you got a problem. And so I look at that and I'm thinking, wait a second, the human mind was not made to forget like that. Because if you're forgetting, you got like Alzheimer's or something, you know what? forgiving really means? Here's what it really means. It means I will forego my right to seek vengeance and justice for what you did to me. That's forgiveness. Does it mean I'm going to forget about it? No, if you've got a functioning mind, chances are you're probably not. But you're saying, you know what? I'm going to forego because there's something bigger at stake here. Let me give you an example that, that uh, if you ever get a chance, there's a book 
that will absolutely blow your mind about how to think about forgiveness. It's called Think No Evil. It's written by a guy by the last name of Beeler, I believe. And he's talking about the school shooting in Pennsylvania, the Amish school shooting. The thing that jumped out at me as I was reading through that particular book was there were people in the Amish community who took the spouse of that shooter meals the night that the shooting took place. I think about that for just a moment. That takes an awfully big person to say, I'm going to forego my right to vengeance because there's something bigger going on here. Guys, we don't do this very well. In fact, here's the reality. There's some of you in this room, you are eaten up by somebody who did you wrong in the past. That person may be dead. And yet, they're controlling you from the grave. I mean, think about that for just a moment. And maybe somebody lives a thousand miles away. They did something to you, and yet you can't get past it. Because we can't forgive them. You're just sitting there thinking to yourself, that's fine. I'm not going to give them a birthday present. Do you realize they may not even be thinking about you? And so here's what it's really like. I heard somebody say, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping they're going to die. We got to do better. And listen to me, for all those of you who are married, some of you in this room, you say you forgive your spouse. And here's what you do. You really hold that behind your back. Until the next time you get into a fight. And then you know what you do? You whip it back out. And your spouse is like, wait, I thought you said you'd forgive. Well, I, I did, but I knew you didn't really mean it. Okay, that's not real forgiveness, folks. Real forgiveness is what Christ did for you on the cross. And if you're holding it behind your back, that's not real forgiveness. Now, those are all the imperatives for the passage in Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, so we look at that and we say, eh, okay, that's, that's a big long list. Realistically, most of us in this room, we can't do all that. So what are our options? Option number one, we say, all right, fine. This is stuff that I, I, I don't do. I'm sorry, honey. Please forgive me. Let's go home and let's work on this. We'll, we'll get our relationship where it needs to be. Small problem. You won't. And the reason I say you won't is because after a while, what's going to happen? You forget. You slip back into that old pattern. All right, what's option B? Option B is we go back and instead of just focusing your eyes on the imperatives, the commands, what if we look at the indicatives? Go back and look at this scripture for a moment. He says in verse 25, Therefore put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Why? What's this say? For we're members of one another. In other words, if I'm not speaking appropriately to my wife, it's not because I'm not trying hard enough. It's because I'm not realizing or acknowledging the reality. That she's not just mine. She's a part of who? Me. The two shall become one flesh, right? We are members of one another. Ah, but it gets better. Hold on. Ephesians 5 that I read you earlier. Take a look at this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her that he might sanctify, cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself. So in other words, my wife is not just a part of me, but I am actually through the way I treat her and nurture her, presenting her to myself. So when I'm not doing these imperatives, who am I actually hurting? I'm hurting myself. Do you see that? That's the first problem. 
We don't practice these imperatives because we don't realize or appropriate the reality that in marriage, we're members of one another. But there's a bigger problem. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Take a look. It says, Husbands ought to love their own wives, verse 28, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of what? His body. Okay, so don't miss this. My wife is not just a part of me. She's also a part of the body of what? Of Christ. I'm sorry? Yep. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 through 31. So, ultimately, she is a part of me and a part of the body of Christ. So, if I'm, if I'm disparaging her, let's say that I'm putting her down, here's what I'm really telling Jesus. I'm telling him, look, this is a part of your body that I don't like, Jesus. I, I love you, but I hate your toe. Okay? I despise your toe. I want to crush your toe. Folks, let me tell you something. That's not a marriage problem. That's a Jesus problem. When you stop realizing your spouse is a part of the body of Christ, because that's when your mouth will open up and you'll call them anything I mean, just anything under the sun because you don't realize you're talking to part of the body of Christ. Ultimately, I say here, it's a problem that you have with Christ and the role that he plays in your life. It is a worship problem. Now, let me point out, I recognize in this room there's probably people here who you may have a spouse who's not a part of the body of Christ. I realize that. There may be a lot of you. But you notice this, while some of the indicatives may not apply, you can still affect your marriage by placing Christ first and hopefully influence that person through your what? Through your conduct. Same thing, by the way, is true for the wives, right? Remember we talked about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husband. Does it say, wives, submit to your own husband because he's worthy of submission and because he's accomplished all the things God says he's supposed to accomplish? Is that what it says? Or does it say, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Why do you submit to your husband? Because of an indicative. Because who Jesus has indicated who he is. You say, no, nah, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. Uh-uh. I, I, I refuse to. I won't do it because I, I, I disagree. He has not done. He hasn't treated me the way I should be treated. Therefore, God, I outrank you, which means ultimately I don't understand the first and the greatest commandment. I don't really love God with all my heart and soul and mind, which means I'm really committing idolatry because I love myself more than God. Oh, I didn't get any amens on that one. Amen, lights. Again, you may not want to hear this, but that's sin. You don't love your husband because he's done everything on your checkoff list. You love your husband because who God says he is. And likewise, husbands, you are to love your wife like Christ loved the church. So what do we do? Do we, do we say, all right, I, I'm going to go back now and rededicate myself, go home and work on all these imperatives? You know, am I, am I just going to focus on all these commands? No. Uh -uh. Instead, here's what we really need to do. Remember that word repent I mentioned about a couple of oxes? We need to repent and ask Jesus to forgive us for not giving him the place in your life that he deserves. Because if Jesus holds the place that he deserves in your life, guess what? You're probably going to treat your spouse the way 
they should be treated. And somebody says, well, you don't understand, Brad. I've been married to this person for so long, and, 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 and I'm not happy. And God wouldn't want me to be unhappy. Okay, time out. Hold up. <laughs> Let me get this straight. God put the spotless lamb, his son, on a cross. He went through a Roman scourging, and then he was crucified but he wouldn't want you to be unhappy? Help you if you think that's true. Because folks, listen to me. Unhappy may be right where he wants you. In fact, unhappy may be the place where you'll bring him the most glory. And we don't think that way very often, do we? Because what we really want is we want to be happy above everything else. Anybody in here ever know somebody who has been diagnosed with cancer? They got that horrible diagnosis, but all of a sudden, their relationship with God, it was like you just poured miracle grow on it. You ever seen that? You think, I don't want cancer. Do you realize cancer may be right where God wanted that person to give him the most glory? Same thing with your marriage. How dare I not love my wife? How dare I, not, I think so much of myself? How dare I be so egocentric, narcissistic, humanistic as to look at this woman who has given me her youth, her life, and say, because I'm not pleased right now, in this moment, I'm done with you. Especially when you look at the fact that God has commanded me as a spiritual leader in my home to wash my wife in the water of the word. And so for in large part, if she's not who I want her to be, whose fault is it? It's mine. Again, we don't have a huge marriage problem. What we've got is a Jesus problem. And so please hear me this evening. If you've got a marriage problem in your house right now, it's not what your spouse is or is not doing. Instead, I would say the problem is Jesus Christ is not magnificent enough for you. You need to go home tonight and you need to ask yourself, am I treating his body with the respect and the dignity that I should? Because if you're talking to your spouse like a dog and she or he is a part of the body of Christ, the answer is no. 1 John chapter 4. Take a look with me. Verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is what? As you step forward from this day forward and you think about your relationships with each other, your relationships with coworkers, your relationships with members in this body, please understand your love should be a reflection of God's love. And if it's not, we need to make changes in our lives. Amen. I told the, the guys before I started, I was going to do my best to give you guys seven or eight minutes to ask questions, make comments, uh, because sometimes when I, I do a lesson like this, it stirs up some things that maybe I didn't touch on, maybe we'll touch on tomorrow evening. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open it up for your questions, comments. Please understand Tomorrow we're going to jump right back in here and we're going to talk a little bit about what about parenting or what about our roles? What, 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 how do we fortify the home? So you got about roughly eight minutes. Questions, comments, the floor is yours. If you'll raise your hand, um, I'll do my best to, to repeat it over the microphone so that others can hear. If you don't ask me questions, I get to ask you questions. Yes, sir. That's right. 
Absolutely. We could start, I mean, the easiest one, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Who is that addressing? And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the what? Nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, we could look at all throughout the, the Old Testament, whether we're talking uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it, it's always put on the fathers being the spiritual leader. Um, one of the things that our culture has done is they have kind of shackled men into being the spiritual leaders of the home that they should be. Let me give you an example of why I say fathers are the, the spiritual leader. When, if you go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, they sinned. Who did God call out? He called out Adam. You then flip over to Romans chapter 5, and it says, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. Why doesn't it say, just as through one couple? Because, I mean, Adam and Eve were both there, right? It says one man. You know why? Because the buck has to stop with somebody. And in the home, that's the man. Um, let, me, let, me, let me give you one more passage to chew on. Uh, look over in Genesis chapter 3. So after they've sinned, God is handing out punishments. Take a look at what he says first to the woman. Uh, da, 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 da. Starting verse 16. To woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and, uh, and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now again, I realize in some places those are fighting words. In fact, <laughs> let, let me see how many men go home tonight and have your wife call you like Abraham's wife did uh, Honey, I want you to call me Lord. <laughs> okay, so her desire would be for him. Now, take a look at the man's punishment. It says in verse, let's see, 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat. Is he saying because you let your wife speak? No. What's he saying? He's saying because you weren't the man and to speak up and say no. In fact, flip back to Ephesians, or Genesis chapter 3. Look with me at verse 6. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her. And he ate. Where was Adam? Right there. What should he have done? He should have said, no. But because you heeded the voice of your wife. Good question. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Oh, man, what, what are some good verses to get over becoming cynical? Um, I, I, would, I would stick in the New Testament primarily, and I would focus on things like, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Um, what, what, did Philippian, what did Paul say in Philippians 4.8? So, let me get you there. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Who can name me the fruits of the Spirit? I mean, I, love. And what's the last one? 
self-control. So, um, let me chew on that a little bit tonight, some more. Those would be the first two things that I would, I would immediately go to just because what that is doing is that's trying to transform your mind. And, and all of this is a, a battle. It's kind of a mental battle. Who are you going to, you know, it's, we always think about those little devils. You got devil here and angel here. What Paul is saying is we got to get rid of that devil side and we got to fill the mind with things that are good so that we will, because what's in your heart comes out of your what? Mouth. Let me chew on that a little bit more. What else? Other comments, questions? It is very much an action verb. Absolutely. And it is a decision. He said love is an action word, right? It is a decision you have to make every single day. Those of you who have been married, you know, there, there are phases. If you've been in a, a marriage more than two decades, sometimes you, you kind of do this. And you go through periods where you're really, really close to your spouse and you, man, you just find them so attractive. And then there may be periods where it's kind of like, okay, we're together. I'm married. And it's in those periods where you have to wake up every day and say, you know what? I'm going to love them. Even if they, they get on my nerves, they do something I don't like, I'm going to love them. Because by doing that, you're going to find yourself back up here, right? Say that again. Sustain love? Absolutely. Yeah. This... Absolutely. Absolutely. Because here's what, here's what happens too often in marriages is somebody says, well, I'll treat them better if they, and you fill in the blank, if they treat me better, if they say nice things to me. If they, and so our, our actions are dependent on what we receive. Okay. That, that's not the love we read about in the Bible. Okay. You have to wake up and say, you know what, even if he says ugly things about me today. Even if he leaves his dirty underwear in the floor and I've told him a million times not to do that, I'm still going to love him. And there's some people laughing right now because they know they have been through that conversation. <laughs> Other comments, questions? That's one of, definitely one of the failures of marriage today. Because you, you talk to millennials today, they're getting into relationships with already the thought of, if, if, if I don't like this after a while, I'll get out of it. Folks, if Christ had that attitude towards the church, we would be in a bad way. Okay? It has to be that covenant type relationship. I, I, I'm actually going to be marrying a couple June the 20th. I've told them, I said... Divorce is not in my vocabulary. you both Christians. Here's the deal. One of you is going to bury the other one. Okay? You will not get divorced. Homicide, maybe. Divorce, no. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you think that it's an option, then there may be a time where you want to explore that option. Yes. So, um, what is your, so in your, in your opinion or um, in biblical opinion, um, what is the way that, so two teens should approach dating as, will this person help me get closer to Christ? And that's the criteria they should be looking for because you were kind of saying yeah. that person making me happy shouldn't be the main criteria. Correct. So, let me, uh, I'm going to real quickly, and I'm, I won't keep you guys over, but I, I do want to go through real quick a couple of things that I think dating has issues with. Bear with me while I bring this up. Here we go.
All right. On the beginning slide. Yeah, I, and that's, that's the word we use at our house. It can go by different names. Some people say biblical dating or Christian dating. Um, take a look real quick. I'm just going to read through these. Dating promotes lust, moderate sexual activity, opening the door for fornication, develops a self-centered feeling, con feeling oriented concept of love, creates a permanent endorphin bond between two people who may or may not spend their life together. You think about this for just a minute. There's some of you in this room, you hear a song, and without any input on you, it's all involuntary, your brain actually releases neurotransmitters about a time when you were with somebody else. You know, you had your song. Okay, well, guess what? You're not married to that person. Um, dating teaches people to break off difficult relationships, conditioning them more for divorce than marriage, develops an appetite for variety or change, lacks the protections and guidance afforded by parental involvement of courtship. It doesn't prepare children to face life's realities because oftentimes in dating, we put our, our best face forward and it's sometimes not who we really are. Uh, devalue sex and marriage. Dating leads to intimacy, but not necessarily commitment. Dating tends to skip the friendship stage of a relationship, often mistakes a physical relationship for love. Dating often, often isolates a couple. How many times have we seen young people who they've got all these friends, they suddenly they're in a relationship with somebody and they don't have anything to do with these other people? Um, distracts young adults from their primary responsibility of preparing for their future. I don't think we do a really good job of teaching that you can serve God single. Amen? Um, creates a, causes discontentment with God's gift of singleness. Creates an artificial environment for evaluating another person's character. I, I'm not going to go through all this, but I, I'll just point three things out. There should be a different motive. What is the motive for going out with this person? Ultimately, it's about getting married, right? So if you're not really interested in getting married, what are you doing messing around with somebody? Number two, there's a different mindset. And by that I mean with dating, it's kind of a what does that person do for me? With this, it's more rather than having somebody have their fantasy list you know, checking off, it's more of a looking for a godly woman. The scripture defines her, a woman he can love, yes, be attracted to, but a woman whom he can serve and love as a godly husband. Last but not least, it's a different method. I am not a real big proponent of sending out two young people, age 17, off by themselves. Because what we're doing is we're basically saying, Okay, we want to see just how good you are at resisting temptation. Not real smart, right? I mean, think about the scenario. Guy comes up, 17 years old, knocks on the door, says, I want to take your daughter out. Okay, daughter comes out, she's all dressed up, looks nice. Dad goes upstairs, grabs the keys to a $250,000 Ferrari. Throws those keys to that 17-year-old. How many of y'all in this room would throw the keys to a $250,000 Ferrari to a 17-year-old young boy? Nobody. Then why do you throw your daughter to him? Because your daughter is worth a whole lot more than that car. Cars can be repaired. Sometimes daughters can't be. I appreciate very, very much your attention, your, your patience with me. Tomorrow night, we're going to kick right back off at 7 o'clock. And again, I'll try to save some time for, for questions and, and comments. I'll stick around a few more minutes tonight. For those of you who just have one that's burning in your heart and you can't sleep without it, I appreciate very, very much, again, everybody being here. Hope you'll invite somebody to be with you tomorrow night. And I will turn it over to whoever has a closing.